Hi there, how are you all doing today? Of course, this is Mache. Welcome to another Stay Inspired Conversation. I'm really excited today. My guest is Brittany Young. Brittany is an engineer. She's a social justice advocate. She's an entrepreneur and she is a change maker. She is a black woman who decided to take on this big conversation or this big topic of dirt bikes. And I won't give her secret, but I want you to hear what she's done in Baltimore around changing dirt bike culture. Let's hear what she has to say. Brittany, thank you so much for, for making yourself available for this conversation. And, and I feel like this isn't even really like a conversation because I love you so much. I'm so proud of everything that you're doing. Like I have been wanting to, you know, we, as you said, we talk offline, mm -hmm. but I've been wanting to publicly have this conversation because you have a secret sauce. And you may not think you have a secret sauce, but you do have a secret sauce. So let me, let me just start right here. 2016 or 17, which was a 16 or 17 for Baltimore Corps, when you won the- 16, 16 going into 17. 16 going into 17, okay. So during that time, Elevation Award put out this um, piece about um, $10,000 to people who could come up with an innovative idea that would make Baltimore better. You applied. To your surprise, you were chosen, and you, along with nine other people, once were awarded ten thousand um, dollars. Your topic was on dirt bike culture, right? Black yeah. woman talking about dirt bikes. Here you are, but the the phenomenal thing about this is, you didn't just get that ten thousand dollars. You weren't just acknowledged by Baltimore Corps, but you have had fellowships with over 10, 12 different organizations, social justice organizations, philanthropic organizations. I mean, the likes of which Open Society Institute, there's um, Echo and Green, there's Red Bull. Um, who else do I have down here? T. Rowe Price Foundation, um, mm -hmm. TED Talk. Mm -hmm. and, and being engaged with those organizations, you have amassed over a million dollars. And I know that number is low. I'm sure you're going to correct me. But let's just even leave it at the million dollar mark. Like in this short amount of time, you have been awarded this kind of money. I want to know from you, give us the 30 second for those people who are tuned in and know nothing about V360. I've never heard anything about it. Give us your 30 second elevator pitch on V360. And then I want you to tell me, Three years later, what do mm -hmm. you think happened? What do you think made people acknowledge and see what you already saw as it relates to changing people's perspective about dirt bikers and dirt bikes? So that's mm -hmm. two parts. Give yep. us your <laughs> and then answer that question. Yep, so thank you for having me. I'm Brittany from B360. We really are teaching people how smart they already were. So in cities across the US, people ride dirt bikes and streets in traffic, but the only way cities have solved that is by incarceration and or dirt bike police task force, which we know are not the only way we should approach situations. We literally teach kids how when you pop a wheelie, that's a science equation. We hire dirt bike riders for our model and we create events in the same, wild, same way that we see on ESPN with X Games. And so, so far it's been 7,000 students, 42 hires, and we are going to keep growing and keep expanding. Oh my goodness. Y'all, did y'all hear that pitch? Like, if you're trying to figure out how to do a 30 second pitch, you need to know Brittany. <laughs> I'm trying to get, you know, I've, I've been in a lot of great experiences and had people like you as great coaches. So I should be able to know some things. Yeah. And I'm always <laughs> learning as a student. <laughs> so again, three years later, what do you think happened? Because I know, like, you know, when you first started in, on this journey, people didn't get it. You know, people yeah. wanted to, but people didn't get it. But three years later, I mean, people from around the world are knocking on your door and they want you to tell them how to do this. They want to know, they want you a part of that fellowship. What do you think happened? Um, I think it was you said, right, that secret sauce. I don't acknowledge that because I feel like it's a million Britney Youngs in the world. But I think it was me being able to package the language and to make that cultural 
like it was divided and be able to bring it together right so while i was at elevation awards i was also on the program at hopkins which is like you know on two opposite ends um my own background engineering but then being from baltimore so i already had my own network that I could talk to work with and then i got to work with more people and i think people saw what i did with a little bit so our first and only money we had for the first two years was just that ten thousand wow. dollars right and so in ten thousand dollars we worked with over two thousand students and hired more than eight dirt bike riders um and well, i honestly can, think I, can i just pause you right there so hmm? so how did you how did you make the ten thousand dollars do what you wanted it to do because for some people ten thousand dollars doesn't sound like a lot of money right <laughs> how did you make that ten thousand dollars do what you wanted it to do mm -hmm. um that's a great question i mean i really i said a lot i didn't have a choice you know i feel like i've been conditioned my whole life to make a little bit turn into a lot mm -hmm. as a black person and a black woman and then know how to survive um with that ten thousand dollars i learned to make it do what it needed by being in programs so elevation awards you know gave us the seed money to incubate the idea and then the social innovation lab at hopkins was the mba program on steroids plus some so we got a lot of great like lawyers coaches um learning how to pitch do logic models and so in that time before even getting the money i was learning how i should use it and what it should look like um and we launched in February of 2017 with that money for our STEM program, but it was based on all the previous conversations I had through my experiences at SIL. Um, and even like the, you know, the million dollars, it hasn't been a million actual dollars. It's been, you know, a good mix of in-kind donations. And I can't wait till we get to actually a million dollars. And I think that has been a part two that's helped us a lot is people have gravitated towards the idea because I, I showed that I can work with a little, but that's also like the part that hinders us too, because, you know, we have done a lot, but we have never seen a grant that's over $20,000. So while I've been in fellowships and I can use that money to give to be 360 and I can pull people in with my experiences and who want to hear from me, I would like to see the same financial return on the opposite end. And I haven't seen that just yet. Mm, and you know, so two, two, two things you said come to mind. One, there's some value in in-kind. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people want the dollars of it, but also the in-kind matters because money gets money, right? And I'm sure mm -hmm. you know this. And, and one philanthropic organization hearing that another philanthropic organization is investing in you brings them to the table, right? The mm -hmm. other thing I want to say is if you are listening to us and if you are watching us, Brittany needs a million dollars. Like, and yeah. if you got it to give, yeah. she's doing phenomenal work with young people and in the space of engineering and STEM, and she needs a million dollars. So if you got it, can you just call her, check her out? We'll, give, Thank you. we'll, we'll leave the information um, for you to be able to do that. Um, I also want to say that not only have you inspired young people as young as five years old to, to take a liking to engineering, and then you have help older men who were continuously targeted by police who were riding dirt bikes um you've helped them to really see this from through a different lens and see that mm -hmm. they could use their knowledge around dirt bikes to really educate a younger generation and one of the things you talked about or you did when we were working together in baltimore was you know just this idea of knowing how to take a dirt bike apart and knowing how to put it back together and what the pieces are and what, how you build a dirt bike. They didn't know that was called engineering. Mm -hmm. And it took you to tell people that these folks don't just ride bikes, they know the inner workings of bikes. And mm -hmm. to see the faces of people in the room when you would say that, especially white people, it was like, oh yeah. snap, these, these, these kids really are smart. I want to know, is this what you mean when you say that part of 360's mission is to interrupt the prison pipeline and to really um, penetrate poverty in people's lives? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So, I mean, I think now there's a national movement around defund the police and people are finally paying attention to the importance of like black lives and the systematic you know oppression that we go through all of that is now tenfold 
Yes, any and everything that I have ever created or started, while it may not be in the forefront of like, you know, Black Lives Matter, is to undo some type of racist prejudice principle that we've all had to deal with. Um, and my own experience is being from Baltimore and being Black. I remember having teachers tell me I couldn't go into engineering because I'm Black. Yeah. Getting into engineering and being the only woman, the only Black person, and being looked at as an admin assistant. Um, and then seeing the same thing too in dirt bike riders and my own brother who went to jail for nonviolent offenses and was incarcerated as an adult. And so what B360 has allowed me to do is actually just cut that in half. You know, instead of people saying, let's call the dirt bike police task force and you can possibly get your bike confiscated, get arrested and be charged with a misdemeanor and get a fine of $1,000. I said, actually, let's see the dirt bike riders as an asset work with them to shift them out of traffic, create opportunities to go to their skill sets. They can still ride pop willies, but in the event space, and how can we actually stop people from going to jail, right? So I think it's that direct correlation of how we're doing it, not by saying, hey, dirt bike riders, y'all are wrong, but by saying, let's just move this to a different avenue. You know, how can we also keep exploring, like you said, they know how to build their bikes, take it apart. Yes, people pay for those skill sets and people should acknowledge you. And then if we're talking about getting out of poverty, you know, not saying that all riders are in poverty, but we know that if you go to jail, that puts you back into a, a poverty system. You know, so it's how can we make sure that we give people options? And that's what B360 has been doing. But it's really to undo that larger system that kept saying, Black people, let's just take us to jail. Right, black people, let's just grow up where we teach kids that if you're five years old, you want to be a dirt bike rider, the only option you have is that you go to jail right now. Right, that's it. It's nothing else. Because the law was written saying that you can't possess a dirt bike in Baltimore, you can't ride on public property or private property. So if I'm a five-year-old little girl who wants to ride dirt bikes, what, what do I have? Nothing but the possibility of jail and more poverty. Wow. So let me ask you, from the space of your initial vision of changing people's perspective about dirt bike riders, what are you most proud of so far in changing perspective? Um, hmm. I mean, I had a lot of work to do, of course, with like people that didn't believe. But I think for me, the most thing I'm proud of is actual riders who now see themselves as an asset and like a commodity and a person that has a voice. Um, so most recently we did a special with WBAL and we had I one of our... I was gonna mention it. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think about people like Mike and Deron, who are our younger students. So Mike is our older student. He was 17 and now he's 22. He's turning 22. Um, so really seeing his transition, right? So at 17, he was just graduating in high school, about to be 18, rode in streets, had a lot of interaction with the law. Um, and really never saw anything other than dirt bikes help me escape. Now what he see is dirt bikes help me maintain and grow, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what we've been good at is creating a new way that people don't have to escape the city, but you can actually feel like you belong in your same city and you can still keep growing and that you don't feel like an outcast because of like laws or systems. Um, so I think that's the biggest mindset shift is really just seeing him how he's grown um and then our younger students the same way most of them i got when they were in fifth grade of course they knew everything about dirt bikes but they had never had anyone ask them why they liked the ride or what they wanted to be in life um and so seeing them now about to be ninth graders where they want to go into engineering they want to be chefs they've been able to travel across the u.s riding bikes and fixing them I think for me, of course, that's the better story. Yeah, the people that finally get it, that's cute. But to have students and young adults who now feel, it's that freedom of being express your voice. And a lot of times we don't have the freedom to just be kids or just the freedom to just be black and to be happy. And so I like the most is that I can see them in that element, black, happy, jovial, um, and not afraid, really. Yeah. And I love that. And yeah. I think that's the biggest shift. And being able to just get on national public spaces or whatever and always advocate for themselves because i think before i felt like it was something that they had to hide mm -hmm. um you know a lot of dirt bike riders wear face masks for that reason and we saw mike get on news he didn't have a face mask on yeah. you know and that was a whole i don't think three years ago he would have even wanted to be on the news because we would have right. been afraid, right and the same thing with like our young holding him and on his back and being a new <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's really the shift that we've been able to give from 
survival mode to thinking about how you sustain and then thinking about how we're about to thrive. And that's something I didn't have until most recently. I always tell people, I just started living at like 27, 28, um, and I'm 31 now. So being able to see that younger and undo kind of how we're taught to just to, you know, survive, I'm really, I'm really excited for. Yeah, I, um, I just want to say one of the eye-opening experiences I had you know, working with you and the people at Baltimore Court was when you said to us in one of your presentations that dirt, when you think about guys and dirt bikes, think about your own hobby. Like there, there are people who like to ride motorcycles. There are people who like to ride bikes. There are people who like to go fishing. Dirt biking is a hobby for them. It's the thing mm -hmm. they do to just say serenata to the world and, and mm -hmm. let the cares of the world off of their back, they get on the dirt bike and they just go. Mm -hmm. That was like, ding, 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 Mache. You know, because all I knew before your statement was, <laughs> I'm so sick and tired of hearing dirt bike ride past my window on Sundays at one o'clock. I mean, you yes. could set your clock to all of these dirt bike riders <laughs> that would come past my window every yes. single Sunday. And the havoc that they would wreak with these cars. But I, when you talk about shifting perspective, you yeah. absolutely shifted my perspective when you said, this is the thing they do to just get the weight of the world off of them. And you talked about the example of the guy who, you know, had lost his brother and mm -hmm. getting on the dirt bike kept him from retaliating up against the person who had killed his brother. And I'm like, this makes sense. That yeah. said, you mentioned the WBAL. You've also been featured on NBC. Um, you have, you take your young people before COVID, you would take your young people with you to conferences to co-facilitate with you and presentation. Mm -hmm. um, you're partnered with Baltimore City Public Schools and mm -hmm. Parks and Recs, and you're partnered with the Mayor's Office of Baltimore City. And I want to know from you, um, What's next? Like, how does it feel for you to give these young people this kind of exposure? I mean, you spoke to it a little bit, but what's next in terms of the more exposure? What does more exposure look like for you? Like, what part yeah. do you want first? Um, you know, with COVID, of course, that kind of disrupted everything, but we've still been doing a lot of things. So one thing that we launched is a toolbox series. So people always ask us sometimes rude questions, but questions from anything of why do people ride to don't they steal bikes to what's the policies, what's the laws, you know, even like how we frame our narrative, how do we get such a strong narrative that's an asset, you know, we don't use underserved, underrepresented, under whatever, under blah, blah. Um, so in this series, it's been three or four episodes, I can't remember right now, um, where we talked about how you actually build a dirt bike park with an actual civil engineer, right? So in our age group, it was actually, I thought it was going to be for kids, but we've had ages from 11 to 57 so far chiming into these series. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one was how you actually build a dirt bike park. So you learn from an expert that's a civil engineer from Baltimore. So again, a young man. And he talked, he walks you through the whole system of, from a civil engineer, what it takes to make a space. The next one we did was with Nicole Mundo from Out for Justice on how do you advocate for your rights. So again, like if we want policies and laws to change, who should we be talking to in city council? Who should we be talking to the mayor, et cetera? The last one we did was how do you build, um, how do you build and control your narrative with Brittany Brito? So she's the person that gave us our front page Baltimore Sun issue. Um, as a journalist, how can journalism get better, especially now in this climate, to make sure that Black voices are always, again, not exploited, but seen as um, carried with integrity. Um, so that was really good. And then we're working on a virtual reality game so we can do our curriculum everywhere so people can stop asking us. Um, but really, because COVID, you know, we want to be able to have people feel the experience of a dirt bike, also be able to repair a dirt bike in a VR sense, mm -hmm. um, be able to go through a classroom experience. So that's one of the big things we're pushing. Um, of course, we need a space. 
that has been one of the hardest battles so far is in order to keep growing our programming, in order to really move that needle, the same way that skateboarders, the same way that bicyclists have a space, the same way you play basketball, you can go to a space. We need a permanent facility in Baltimore controlled by B360. So we can have a classroom area, we can do indoor and outdoor riding, we can manufacture dirt bikes in the future, we can make equipment, helmets, etc. So I would consider it like, think of everything dirt bikes house under one unit, but it's multifaceted that we're bringing jobs to the community. We explore games and we create events with like companies, but we also have classroom and skills area to keep growing the talent. So that's like our big thing that's next, which is why we need like a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in the short term, we'll be working on like a van so we can pop up to different places and cities um, and do some of our pop-up workshops. So that's in a very, very, very short term. One of the things you have mastered is the pitch. Oh. Like, <laughs> you, you all haven't seen anything until you see Brittany pitch B360. That said, um, you know how to talk about your vision. You know how to command a room. You know how to put your words out there in the way that people can feel you. You have figured out how to take logic models and pitch decks <laughs> and graphics and strategic plans and make them sing, right? Yeah. What do you say to the entrepreneur or to the creative or the innovator who's watching us and saying, I don't know what to do. I have this great idea. I haven't figured out how to build a pitch deck. I definitely can't get what I want to do down to 30 seconds. Or I've been talking to people and they don't think my idea is important. What do you say to that person that's trying to figure it out who is where you were three, four years ago? First, I would say I'm always learning and growing <laughs> because like, yes, you give me a lot of hope that my, you know, my pitch is good, that kind of stuff. But I know it's always room to improve. And I think as an entrepreneur, that's first and foremost, you're always going to be learning. I learned a lot in three years but I'm gonna learn even more in the next five, 10, whatever, because I'll have more things to create. So like this video game is a new learning opportunity for me because I'm not a master in the game, but I learned like the back end, what's gonna happen with that kind of stuff. So I would say acknowledging that first, that entrepreneurship is not a linear path. It is ups, downs, highs, lows, but as long as you're coachable and able to have your own why of why you're doing something, but be able to like listen, but not be all the way influenced and be able to take what you need from people, not take literally, but like seek sound advice. And that was one thing you taught me too. It's like, yes, people will constantly give you 20 million pieces of advice and you have to figure out what's going to make the most for you, your mission, your vision. Um, then I would say after you figure out why you do something, test it out. You know, so maybe go to the group that's going to be the most impacted. So we did for B360. I was a teacher at the time, too. I first went to my students. I asked them what they want to be a part, how they would like it, would they receive the curriculum. The answer was yes. And this is testing your assumptions. So that's what that means. These are like, you know, our users slash clients, if I got really into the business side. The second group was dirt bike riders doing the same exact thing, getting feedback, critiques, listening. And that's a real strong set of entrepreneurship I don't think people take account of. It's not a lone wolf strategy. And I think people have glorified entrepreneurship that you go far by yourself. No, you have to really get insight from the people you want to serve. Um, so that was the next check. And that's actually how I got people like Mike um, from that group. Then the harder part for me was the, the other checks with police. So having a meeting um, with police officers and a police commissioner and Councilman Pinkett, and then just keep getting those checks, which was, I'm making this sound really easy. It was not. And then I launched with the public forum. So an intentional place where I can bring all of the groups together with community members like you, you know, who did not like dirt bikes, understand so we can workshop on why and how that felt. And then, of course, learning. I learned most people never knew the law, never heard from a dirt bike rider. Riders had never heard from community members and vice versa or police. 
And then that is what informed me to create our STEM program. And with our STEM program, I launched with 30 students. So we got to 7,000, but it was just 30. And I was very intentional and small because I wanted, you know, basically I was able to provide free programming for our students, but I wanted that feedback. I wanted that honest answers. I wanted them to, I learn, I'm learning from them, right? So, and I wanted to be able to make sure that I was able to give as much as time and attention. And the same thing with the riders we start, first started working with, those eight. I wanted to make sure they would give me feedback on what worked, what didn't. And I was still very much in the trenches. It wasn't me leaving them to, to our curriculum. It was me teaching right hand in hand with them or neck and neck. Um, and so everything that I've done, I've always done it first by, with me to then be able to figure out how it's going to look with the next person. And so like that scaling. Um, and then really, I would say the real part is just being intentional. I think a lot of times people want to start things for their name to be on it and the glory. But if you also looked a little deeper, like if you come to Baltimore saying you want to do a uh, food justice equity work, I'm pretty sure there's at least 20 urban farms in the city that you should partner with instead. Right. And so just yeah. being really, on, it's no need to start something new if it already exists and works. And even if the thing doesn't work, how can you lend your voice, your time, or your fundraising capacity to help that get to the next level? What I experienced as B360 is people often, <laughs> not not too often, but will have ideas around dirt bikes, and it's usually men, and won't take the time to hit Google and see that the work has already existed and come with these high profile plans. And then it's like, I've been here this whole time. Why not just try to partner with me? Why not just use your voice to fundraise? Please don't create a program off my back because you're not helping. We now have to compete for the same funding and I'm not competing with you because we've actually been doing the work. So I would say that in itself of just taking the, the etho out of entrepreneurship would save so many people so much time and so much heartache and we can actually go further and do more just by hitting Google and doing some research to figure out who you should be working with to partner with. Um, and again, like, I think, you know, but in certain industries, of course, like beauty is always room and certain social impact ways is always room. But I think if you have a specific target, always try to work with the people that's already there. Because if not, you can displace what they've been doing and displace stuff that may have been in the pipeline for so long because now here's a new person. So stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's all great advice. Um, and, I, and I hope what people heard and all of that was, it takes time. It's mm -hmm. there are different steps. And as you said, there are different layers. It's not um, quick and easy and dirty. It's, it's you got to be willing to be in it for the long haul, yeah. whatever that looks like, right? And you got to be willing to learn about yourself and learn about the thing that you're doing and be patient with partners and with people who don't get it. Like, you know, I remember sometimes you would leave a meeting and you just were so annoyed, you know, that people did not get this the way you got it, but this was inside of you and, and you had the responsibility of getting it outside of you <clears throat> and into the people who really didn't get it, but and, and you've done a, a, an amazing job at that. I want to know, um, next to the last question is, what do you now know about you that you didn't know before? Three years later, what, what have you learned about Brittany in this process and this journey that you've taken um, as a social justice advocate that you did not know before? Um, my patience. <laughs> That's probably the biggest thing. My patience and... Um... Patience, that virtue, because like you said, I'm a person. I remember I used to talk really, really, really fast for that reason too. <laughs> you have got to know this that you know Brittany will be practicing for for presentations, and she will be going a million miles a minute, and I'd be like, Britt, you gotta slow down because people, you know what you're saying, people don't know what you're saying yeah. because they can't hear you. So absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you know, patience and everything of just how to like breathe in a moment um not be as hard on myself like because again like you said it was always in my head i planned out what our five years looked like in our first year and i'm pretty much on target for it it's, but that can be frustrating when it seems like things align and then not 
really understand why bureaucracy takes so long. So that's always going to be my frustration, but it's been patience. Um, the second was being able to switch from anger to love, you know. So, of course, when I started B360, it was because I was fed up, frustrated, and tired with the way that things was working from Freddie Gray to people saying we had all these STEM jobs to we only create a dirt bike police task force. Um, and while that's the fire that initially burnt, I always consider like a chimney, that type of fire will burn black and burn your house down. And then the fire I have now is from the love of the work that I do. And that is like, you know, the clear smoke that won't burn my house down, but it keeps fueling me. Um, and that's really by making a conscious decision of not really listening to naysayers and not really, you know, getting validation from people who are not whom we choose to serve. Um, it's too many people rooting for me, for me to be mad about people who don't matter. Um, and so really leading with that part. So I'm glad I found that. And I would say, what is the most thing I've learned? I've been prepared for this type of work my entire life. Um, I would say it's not easy. It's not, you know, I wake up every day and things are happy. No, I make it look easy. But it's because really the skill set of being from the city and being black and being a woman has really prepared me for anything that could be thrown in my way. Um, and I'm proud of how I handle stuff now, as opposed to how I would have handled it at 19, 20, et cetera. Cause yes, every day I want to punch people in the face, but I just put that into my work <laughs> and I put it into the love side of the work. So awesome. yeah, I'm proud of that type of stuff. Good stuff. So I believe as we uh, wrap up our conversation, I believe that gratitude changes everything. Um, I'm huge on just being grateful. What is Brittany Young grateful for today? Um, I mean, today, right now, health. I just recently had a friend that was diagnosed with COVID, you know, um, so just health in general, being able to be in the comfort of my own home, being able to talk to you while you're in LA and I'm in Baltimore. So I just think being just more like grounded in the world that's around me, that things are crumbling and falling, but I'm also in this moment still living out my dreams, still helping create pe more people's dreams. Um, so just being thankful for this space. Like, yes, it's not hard. I mean, it's not easy. It's, it's very, very, very hard. But I know where I was three years ago when I had three jobs and also creating B360. And so I just appreciate now actually being able to sit with B360 and see it grow as opposed to trying to work on three different jobs to fund it at the same time. And then again, health is wealth right now. So I'm just really, I'm glad I haven't really lost anyone to COVID. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Brett. I appreciate you. Thank you for taking the time to be with me. You are so absolutely beautiful. I'm so proud of you. You have done so much in such a little bit of time, and it may not feel like it to you, but there are some people who have been trying to make their dream come true or who have had a vision and haven't gotten an ounce of funding five years into it, 10 years into it. So, you know, as I've always told you, don't take for granted what you're doing and how God is really smiling on you and breathing on everything that you're doing. You're amazing. And I'm just grateful that you were able to take some time with me today. I'm grateful that, you know, in 2017, you came in my life because woo, <laughs> that was, before that it was, it was a journey. <laughs> All right. So keep up the great work and we will talk soon. Yep. Thank you. Bye -bye.